Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the study this morning. Um, we're going to be looking at Samson. <clears throat> I'd send out a chart. Uh, so hopefully people looked at that. But before we begin, can we open with a word of prayer? <laughs> Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful for the time that we have to study your word. And we invite your presence into the study this morning. May your Holy Spirit bring a conviction and clear understanding. Uh, we pray for those searching for truth. And we just ask, Lord, that um, you can help uh, them find this truth in their lives that comes from your word. That they can dig for this buried treasure. We're thankful for the way that you've led this movement. We ask for your continued leading, that we can understand these lines and how they relate to um, our present duty. And we pray this and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning again. So I'd sent out a chart, and um, we're going to look at that in a minute. But uh, just an overview of, of what we're looking at with Samson. So we did look at this a bit yesterday. We know that we have this birth of Samson. And uh, there is all this preamble to his birth, the events that occur. And those themselves then uh, become aligned. So the birth of Samson doesn't happen until the end of this chapter. <clears throat> then in chapter 14, uh, we're going to have Samson's marriage. And uh, that line itself has all kinds of interesting details and symbols. And then we're going to have the story of Samson and Delilah. Right? So there's these three chapters that we get in Samson. And we have some symbols that we see in Samson that we've seen uh, in uh, chapter 16. We're going to have like the number of, of, of this payment that's made and all kinds of different details that we've looked at. Now, um, we talked yesterday about creating a line that normally you would start with, uh, yeah, and, and Aran put there 13 times 14 times 15 is 2730. So that's a symbol of March uh, 27th, which is a symbol for the Levites. So, yeah, there's tons of symbols in, uh, in this story. Now, when we looked at this before, we saw that, that uh, basically three lines can be drawn. That is, uh, Samson is not simply just uh, a line. Um, he's, he has a lot of detail attached to him and, uh, basically three different narratives. So, um, when we drew up the lines before, what we had was a couple of charts, though oddly we didn't have a third chart. Now, just dealing with the, the numbers of Samson, Samson, of course, as we saw, 13 times 14 times 15 is this 273, 2370. Three, what is it? Two, I can't remember what, what did he say the number was. Um, yeah, 2730, right? So 273, that's correct. Um, and... We also know that just the gematria of Samson, whether you do the normal gematria or the reverse gematria, you get the number 81. That's why down here I have this. Uh, here, July 18, 2020 is, is marking Samson. And we get this 81. And if you reverse it, it's 81. So that has to do with just th this odd uh, characteristic of his name in, in English gematria of both. Uh, where A represents 1 and A represents uh, 26, right? So, <clears throat> and um, so this line here, um, as you can see, it talks about a lion roaring. Uh, this is going to be 
uh, dealing with Samson's wedding, right? Uh, we're also going to have the 30-30-30 that we saw uh, previously in Judges. And um, that symbol that gives us that 777 structure. Um, we have marked some of these verses. So, you know, we have Judges 14-14. As December 25th, 2021, and we're going to have to figure out what that means as far as putting this on a line. So we have some dates marked, September 11th, 9-11, and we have 11-9, both our lions roaring. Um, and then in this line above, this is looking more at chapter 13. So we didn't end up drawing out chapter 15, which I'm not sure why we didn't. I don't think. Oh, actually, we did. Um, yeah, we started with chapter 15, but yeah, I just don't have Samson's name there. So, so we drew up chapter 13, 14, and 15 as these separate lines. Uh, but they're not complete lines in that we don't have um, all of these uh, put together with, you know, uh, the first angel arriving, second angel arriving, third angel arriving, and then the empowerment and formalization of each of those. So, so we're going to try to do that. Um, since we've gone through Samson twice, we should just uh, be able to remember lots of it, though um, we're going to have to read over it and put that together. So um, I don't know what the best way to do this is. So I'm just going to move this up here. All the sim these dates up here, which are supposed to point April 5th. Now, um, so Angela says, according to uh, Joshua, 1940, Dan had the seventh lot. And in Judges 13.2, we see that Manoah was an inhabitant of one of the allotted towns, Zora. Okay. So we know um, that this is... Uh, you know, dealing with the fact that Samson is... Um, from Zora, right? He's of the tribe of Dan. Uh, his dad's name is Manoah. His wife is barren, right? There's going to be this whole story about uh, this son being born, Samson. Um, but the point that I'm, I'm trying to get to right now, so we probably could come back to some of that, is that uh, we're going to take all of these three lines and put them on a single line first. So what we had done is we had looked at each of the chapters as a separate line. Um, but we, we would recognize that, um, that we have a line in and of itself just in the story of Samson. So I'm going to borrow one of these lines here. doesn't matter which one I borrow. Okay. Let me put this line down here. So this is going to be Samson. And based on what we had in those three lines, we would know that chapter 13 is going to be about uh, the first angel's message. Chapter 14 is going to be about the second angel's message. And chapter 15 is going to be about the third angel's message. Does that seem reasonable to people based on how we've put together these lines before? Yes. Okay. Starting to see this repetition of three. 
Yes, the, the repetition of, of the three. So sometimes we have, you know, three judges uh, representing a single line. Sometimes we have chapters representing the three, right? Um, so there's different ways in which these are structured, but we can see how this is very logical. So yeah. Um, yeah. just before you go any further, one of the things that I noticed about chapter 14 is that it's actually seven plus seven. Okay. Yeah, so it's uh, the 14th chapter. Yeah. I, 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 it's just something that dawned on me just a minute ago. I mentioned it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and one of the things interesting about uh, the book of Judges is we when we first started studying Judges, I mean, we studied the last part of Judges first uh, because that part actually is at the beginning. But Judges is written in this way where uh, the early part of the story is put at the end of the book. And, and there's reasons for that, right, from a interpretive point of view and how we, we're applying the book of Judges. Because it has to do with this repetition of history. But, um, yeah, so the fact that we have 13, 14, and 15 for Samson, we have these three chapters. Uh, allows us to put it on this line in this way. So when we put uh, the arrival of the first message, I mean, that's not going to start at the beginning of chapter 13, because chapter 13 is uh, basically this period of darkness, right? So the birth of Samson is going to be the time of the end, but there is a prehistory uh, to his, his birth. Now, that becomes you know, rather interesting in how we created these lines. I mean, when we look at chapter 13, um, we have all of these things about his name not being known. Now, uh, so this as a line itself uh, is going to have Judges 13, 13 as sort of the center that is... We created this line, but we haven't put in the way marks here, uh, which we're going to have to do as well. So the first thing I would want to do is, is take this whole line of Samson, fade out, and then go back and address each of these chapters as a line. So, uh, I mean, I think this is going to be the primary um, idea that's going to be presented in the camp meeting in July is we're going to have we're going to show how the lines are structured based upon you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, uh, you know, there's lots of things we're going to have to leave out in, in looking at what we've studied in understanding the lines. And then we're going to get this period of the judges and show how these lines are constructed. So then we have this line of the judges, and then we have uh, these lines that occur with each of the waymarks. Uh, but then with Samson himself, the last one, the arrival of the third angel, um, we're going to have these three separate lines. But above that is just the line of the judges itself, or the line of Samson himself. So we have the line of Samson, and then we have three lines uh, that come from those primary waymarks, the arrival of the first, the arrival of the second, the arrival of the third. So that's going to be an expansion of those waymarks. If I understand how how this is done, we might we might notice some details about how this line is constructed. So we haven't done it yet, um, but we can see that what we had in Judges thirteen thirteen is we had this doubling that becomes like this center of a chiasm, and um, when we look at, at uh, Chapter 14, you know, we have Samson um, basically as the center of a chiasm as well, or, or center of the structure. He's the second angel's message. And, and we put Samson there, uh, his name, as July 18, 2020, right? So with that gematria of his name. But there's still more we have to figure out regarding that. So... In this line, you can see there is a, an 11-9, a July 18, a December 25th, 2021. But that's just chapter 14. 
And then with chapter 15, um, we saw that this was relating primarily to April 5th, 2030. That is that one. That's what this was focusing on. But yet we also see here the 300, right? So we saw the 300 in these other lines as well. So the 300 showed up repeatedly. So we see this in the story of Samson, the 300 foxes. And, and so that's a symbol that we, we've been using for a long time but don't think that we fully understand the implications of the 300. And, and it shows up different places on different lines based upon what those lines are representing. <clears throat> so, so lots of different symbols. And so we're going to have to try to put these on a line. So when we look at chapter 13, um, I'm saying that there is this uh, darkness and, and maybe what we would do, we might even say, well, oh, let's, let's look at this. So we got, we have some kind of darkness and we know that this is this prehistory uh, that exists before the birth of Samson. Now, here we put Judges 13.13 13 as this particular waymark. That is, this, this history creates a reform line. Just as when we zoom into uh, 1798, we're going to have a reform line that addresses William Miller. Right? Miller has his own reform line. 1989, we zoom into it. Jeff has a reform line. The events in these reform lines can be events preceding that date and following that date that you're zoomed into, right? So it's it's not like there's a particular way that when you zoom into a waymark that you have a pattern of how those dates are going to be expressed in that reform line. Uh, what you have to do is you have to figure out what's the period of darkness and when does the message arrive um, in the way mark that you are zooming into? So yeah, but then when you when you so if you look at what that zoom that way mark is, it's addressing a period of darkness. If it's if it's the first angel arriving, there's a period of darkness. And if you zoom into that, you know, 1798 or 1989, or you know, the birth of Christ, or all of these different you know, if you're going to zoom into Cyrus, because that's going to, uh, there's going to be a reform line that addresses that history. You can take a reform line dealing with Cyrus, and it's going to deal with um, the events connected with the fall of Babylon and the end of these time periods. And that would just be Cyrus's reform line. But Cyrus is the first angel's message in the reform line of the decrees. So, so when we look at Judges chapter 13, so that's what we're going to do now, um, we're going to have to decide in the whole line of the Judges where the time of the end is. And that's going to be different than we when we do this reform line of Judges 13. The time of the end isn't necessarily the same date. It could be, but it may not be, right? So um, I have to share that screen. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines 40 years. So normally what we would look at is we would look at um, there's a time period, right? That's the period in which they're uh, being oppressed. And remember that we've looked at these enemies that have been left in the land. They're meant to be there for God to uh, try his people uh, to help them, right? The other thing that we have with uh, Samson is that there is 
um, this ironic aspect to Samson. Now that would just deal with the moral aspects, but is morally Samson does not represent Christ. He represents human nature. But when we when we then apply this, we're we're just reversing the moral aspects. We're not taking the whole thing and making it all ironic. That is, the symbols are still the symbols. They mean what they mean. We don't switch the symbols to mean the opposite, right? <clears throat> And we can see, though, that he typifies Christ in that, uh, just like when Christ is born, we see a lot of these, this language, we see this language in Isaiah 7, we see this language in the New Testament, where we can parallel uh, the birth of Samson with the birth of Christ. So there's all of these symbols, and we're not going to go through all of them. Judges 13, 1 with Judges 10, verse 6 and 7. Well, we have the Philistines there uh, as well. Um, what else did you want us to see there about Judges 10, verse 6 and 7? Is that it? Just the, that the Philistines are mentioned there? That was the main thing, but just because they turned away from God, then came the 40 years of oppression. So they'd earned it. Okay, well, they earned it. Um, yeah. So, so they, they had wandered away from God. We have this uh, 40 years of oppression. So normally we would just take that and say that's the period of darkness. But there's more to this period of darkness than just that it's 40 years in the hands of the Philistines. Right? Because there is a darkness about the fact that... Um, Manoah's wife is barren. So a woman represents a church. And so the, the fact that she's barren and she, she then hasn't had a son. And an angel of the Lord appears unto her and says, Behold, thou art barren and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. So there is a prophecy regarding a birth of a son. Right? Correct. Okay. So, so the 40 years, sometimes we just mark the period. But here, there is also this prophecy. And, and this prophecy is going to relate to not just the birth of a son, but the conditions under which uh, she, the wife of Manoah, has to uh, behave in order for this son to be born, right? Or one, maybe not in order to, but once he's born, in order to, for him to fulfill his role, he needs to be an, a Nazarite unto God from the womb. And then the promise is he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. We know that this is a process that's going to take time. Um. And then the woman's going to tell her husband about it, uh, that he was like an angel. Um, but she didn't ask where he came from, and he didn't tell her his name. So uh, there's this information that isn't there, right? And so we know that when we created this line of the judges, it was divided by not knowing the name and the name being made known. So if we're going to start this with um, uh, a time of the end, we're not going to have the time of the end yet in this story because this is really a prophecy preceding the time of the end. And if we look at... Um, our history, when we look at 1989, do we have anything that parallels this? Can you can you say that again to me, but in, maybe in a different fashion? Okay. Prior to 1989, 
when 1989 came, November 9th, 1989, I'd been studying. I knew that was a fulfillment of prophecy based upon Lewis F. Weir's writings. Right. So okay, that was, that was pre-89 then. Yeah. So prior, prior to 1989, uh, I knew based upon reading Lewis F. Weir's works that the Soviet Union was going to fall. There's going to be this alliance between the papacy and the United States, because that's what he taught. And um, so I think it would have been in 88, maybe a bit earlier that I got his books. I can't remember exactly. Um, these, these were republished in the 80s by uh, Le Hirondel, uh, whatever the guy's first name is. And he was publishing um, Louis F. Weir's books, republishing them, uh, because he had been, um, in, I think, in his doctoral dissertation doing research regarding uh, dispensationalism. And he found that Louis F. Weir's books uh, really had an answer against uh, dispensationalism and uh, the pro prophetic model of the evangelicals, right? So, so that that's why I was reading Lewis F. Weir's books. But yeah, there was this uh, <clears throat> prediction or understanding of uh, Daniel 11, verse 40, right? So he was interpreting Daniel 11, verse 40 as verse 40a was the fall of the papacy, papacy being king of the north, and then uh, the king of the south being France, and then that in the future the king of uh, the king of the south was the USSR, and the king of the north still was the papacy, uh, but this time with the armies of the United States of Protestantism at his behest. So this was the the joining of Protestants uh, with the papacy. So. So that was before 1989, before November 9th, 1989, that I'd read that material. So, so we had a prophecy about uh, the end of the four generations. That would be the 40 years, right? The 40 years are going to represent the four generations of Adventism. So when we, when we looked at this line, Judges 13, as the line itself, um, we didn't actually start with 1989, though we could have. I mean, we put there, uh, or maybe we did. I'm trying to remember what we did. Um, yeah, we started with November 9th, 1989, but we tied it to um, uh, to um, that whole history, basically 1989 to 2019, with 9/11 in there. So we. We looked at all these, the 11 nines and the 911, and we saw that those all represented that uh, period in that line of the time of the end, that it, that's what's being represented. But if we're going to take this, this line of chapter 13 and we're going to put it as a waymark, um, we're not going to start it um, uh, in the same way, right? That is. I mean, we treated this as a whole line, this chapter as a whole line, but now we're treating it just as the first angel itself. So then that's going to be different how we put this on a line. How we decide what the time of the end is, is going to be different here than it is <coughs> when we do it as the whole line of Samson, right? Yes. Okay. So it, now it is the first part is describing the period of darkness. Right. Once we put it into the whole line where when we started in chapter 13, we almost just address this as here is the time of the end. Right. Because we, we have to deal with it as a whole line. So when it starts at the time of the end, it, it, it as chapter 13, 
it's going to be November 9th, 1989. Not quite right. No, chapter 13, verse 1 isn't going to be that because it's going to address a little bit that period before. Um, but you're definitely not going to take chapter 13 by itself and put the birth of Samson as the time of the end, right? But if you're taking the three chapters together, you could mark the birth of Samson as the time of the end, right? I'm not saying we're doing that, but we could. Does that make sense? Uh, well, it does to me. Okay. Because, you know, we're going to get in 13 verse 24, and the woman bare a son and called his name Samson. And the child grew and the Lord blessed him. And the spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshtahol. So we could, I'm not saying that we have to do that, but we could take uh, this whole story as just representing the birth of Samson, right? So it, it's going to give us a little bit of the period of darkness prior to the birth of Samson, but it's not going to be the birth of Samson, just his birth, that marks the time of the end it's going to be the story of his birth that marks the time of the end but we would have to say exactly when does the time of the end begin using chapter 13. so obviously if we zoom in we're going to see this whole reform line of the birth of samson but we could just take say chapter 13 is the arrival of the first message if we put it on a line Right. So, so we could do that. So that's what I'm gonna, we're going to do. We're just going to do that here. So you could just put at the beginning. Um, right here. This is going to be Judges 13. That's the birth of Samson. Now, there's an increase of knowledge. There's going to be a formalization and empowerment. Those don't have to occur in chapter 13. Those could be in chapter 14, right? I'm not saying that it is, but I'm just saying it could be, right? So we have to decide that. How much of Judges 13 is going to be this arrival of the first angel's message? Because we could have chapter 13, it's that the actual birth of Samson is the empowerment, right? But I'm just letting, letting you know how we could do this. I'm not telling you what we should do as far as where we're going to put all the different waymarks. But if we were going to create a line um, and we knew that we had chapter 13, 14, and 15, we wouldn't necessarily have to say chapter 13 is just the first angel and everything in is in chapter 13. And then chapter 14 is the second angel and everything there is in chapter 14. Right? We, we don't have to do it that way. So we have to decide what events and what symbols are best placed at these various waymarks. Now, so when I put Judges 13 there, I mean... Obviously, there's a period of darkness, so you would say it's the 40 years. Um, but it would be different. When we did Judges 13 as a line, um, we can't get confused between these two is what I'm trying to say. We have to look at 13, 14, and 15 just as a continuous narrative and decide um, where, where we place this. Now... I still think we would put place Judges 13 as these first three waymarks. But I'm saying we wouldn't have to do that just because we have three chapters. We would have to look at the symbols to decide. That's right. We have to decide by the weight of the evidence. Yeah. Yeah. So, so chapter 13 is about the birth of Samson. And, and you could see how the birth of Samson could be the empowerment of the birth of Samson. Right? Well, we definitely see an angel coming down. Right. Uh, so, so announce the, it. 
Right. And so that's so that at the beginning would be the main reason that we would say, well, you know, the time of the end here is going to be with this angel arriving. So, you know, so normally what I would do then is I'm just going to and remember, we're, we're always doing these things tentatively, but we seem to get stuck with them once we um, once we do them. So. So I'm going to say that Judges 13, verse 24, is this empowerment of the first angel, which is, this is the birth of Samson, right? In Judges 13, 24. <clears throat> That's where it says, a woman bare a son and called his name Shimshon, right? And the child grew and the Lord blessed him. And the spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Ashtaol. So, so if we're going to take it this way, so I'm just saying if we place this as the empowerment, then we would have to look at a formal, formalization as being uh, previous to this. Now, um, so we know there's going to be this injunction to the woman regarding how she is to live. And then Manoah, when he goes to this angel of the Lord, um, he wants to know what he is to do, right? And then we're going to have this name of the angel, Palmoni, right? It's secret. Um, that's going to refer to the wonderful number or the number of secrets. And... Um, he, where is this here? Um, in verse 12, Manoah said, now let thy words come to pass. How shall we order the child? Right. So he wants to know not just how his wife is to act in preparation to the birth of the child. He wants to know how he should teach the child or order the child and how shall we do unto him? Right. And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, of all that I said unto the woman, let her beware. She may not eat of anything that cometh of the vine, neither let her drink wine or strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing. All that I commanded her, let her observe. So. So. So it's kind of interesting here when he asks, how shall we order the child? He doesn't. Um, he doesn't give any details about what to do with the child here. He just says what to do with the wife. Um, and then Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, I pray thee, let us detain thee until we shall have made ready a kid for thee. And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, though thou detain me, I will not eat of thy bread. And if thou wilt offer a burnt offering, thou must offer it unto the Lord. For Manoah knew not that, it, that he was an angel of the Lord. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, what is thy name, that when thy sayings come to pass, we may do thee honor? And the angel of the Lord said unto him, why askest thus, thou thus after my name, seeing it is secret? Right. So Manoah took a kid with a meat offering and offered it upon a rock unto the Lord. And the angel did wondrously. And Manoah and his wife looked up, looked on. For it came to pass when the flame went upward, up toward heaven from off the altar, that the angel of the Lord ascended into the flame, in the flame of fire. And Manoah and his wife looked on and fell on their faces. But the angel of the Lord did no more appear to Manoah and his wife. Um, and Manoah knew that he was an angel of the Lord. And Manoah said unto his wife, we shall surely die because we have seen God. But his wife said unto him, if the Lord pleased to kill us, he would not have received a burnt offering and a meat offering at our hands. Neither would he have showed us all these things, nor would, as at this time, have told us such things as these. And the child and the woman bare a son and called his name Samson and the child grew. Right. So if we're going to look at a formalization if, if the birth of Samson, of course, is the empowerment, this formalization is this interaction that happens re regarding this offering. Right. So that's if we if we take it that way. 
So what do people say about this? Because I don't want to do this myself, right? I'm always, um, I feel like I'm putting these things on a line and you're just agreeing just to be nice. Um, no, um, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's not the reason for silence. For okay. Me. Okay. Because when I have a question, I have to ask the question. Because yeah, yeah. if things don't make sense, I'm, I'm going to start asking questions. But if they make sense, I really don't, I don't ask questions, bro. Yeah. So if we were going to put place this as a formalization, this story of this interaction with the angel. So first we would say the angel came to the woman. That's the arrival of the first message. So if we were going to, um, if we that's were going to, yeah. So if we were going to do it that way, we have the period of darkness. That's the forty years, and, and um, uh, this there's this message, this prophecy uh, that she shall conceive and bear a son, and that's going to be the arrival of the first message, right? So this message is going to be about Samson. Now it has to do. Remember all of these lines of the judges. The overarching aspect is. Um, it has to do with the promised seed, right? There's the promise that was made to Abraham regarding this nation that would come out of Egypt, out of this land that was not theirs. They'd be delivered. Uh, they're going to be brought to the promised land. And the blessings that were given to the sons of Jacob by Jacob, Israel, right? So they're the children of Israel. And, you know, they get called out of Egypt, they go into the promised land. Their promise is fulfilled. But they don't conquer all of the enemies of the land. And so they're left in there to try them, to prove them, to test them. And, and that's what the period of the judges is. It's this period in which this is being addressed. But we know over, overall, this is about the promised seed and the fulfillment of previous prophecies. So... When we look at Samson and we see here that the arrival of the third message, because that's what Samson represents in this line of the judges, is going to be about this promised seed. And now when we're making an application to our history, uh, we can see that this has to do with a parallel between this, the, the line of the judges, which is we would take in a literal sense to, to talk about the promised seed because this is all going to lead eventually to Christ. Um, so all of these prophecies are going to continue, but Judges is this particular history. And we apply it to our history. We're obviously applying it symbolically. So that would have to do with the message, our message, which is about the 144,000, which is the promised seed, right? That the bruised, uh, the bruised head of... Or, or the crushed head of the serpent is going to be crushed. But the 144,000 have to go through this experience. It's going to bruise their heel, right? So the 144,000 represent Christ at the time of the end. And this is the thing that is often mocked within Adventism by um, those that oppose what they call last generation theology. I mean, I had a pastor years ago, you know, saying, oh, so you're just going to have a bunch of little Christs, you know, that's what the 144,000 is. And but you know, basically, yes, they're going to be Christ's character perfectly reproduced in his people. They're going to demonstrate that what Jesus accomplished at the cross was not just um, imaginary. It actually can be worked out in the life of his followers, that they can go through the same experience my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And still be faithful. That, that's the issue that closes up the great controversy. Or it's the event that addresses that issue of the great controversy. Is the 144,000 in the time of Jacob's trouble. That they're going to accomplish this. And they don't accomplish it by getting some kind of, you know, fallen human or, or sinless human nature. They still have their fallen natures just as Christ did. They, nothing magical happens. You know, the close of probation isn't God or Christ declaring, okay, now you can't sin anymore, right? 
He's declaring what is. Let him that is righteous be righteous still. Right? That is, the work of character perfection has already occurred, and Christ just declares it at the end. And, and also the fact that those others who had received all this light at the end, they're not going to turn from their unrighteousness, no matter how much the plagues trouble them. Um, they're not interested in having a Christ-like character. So, um, so the idea then of this, the story of Samson, in this ironic story, this type of Christ, is illustrating the victory that the 144,000 particularly have at the end of time. So it represents Christ, but it also represents human nature, Christ in his human nature. You know, Christ overcame all of these things that Samson manifests. But the 144,000, uh, we are to overcome those things. So this three-step testing prophetic message uh, develops and demonstrates two classes of worshipers. And so when the third angel arrives, that's going to be related to the victory over self that Samson does illustrate. Right? In the end, he's victorious. Yes. And, and we can see this even in the line of Abraham. I mean, as much as um, you know, Abraham is an example of faith, righteousness by faith, in that he obeyed God, you know, he left Ur of the Chaldees, and he separated from his, his family and his father's house. Okay. Um, that, um, Still, in the end, he's victorious when he offers up Isaac. So if he had not been victorious in the end, could we look at his earlier life as victorious? We no. can we, yeah, we can focus upon the negative aspects of, of Abraham. The reason why he's an example of righteousness by faith is because in the end, he is an example of righteousness by faith. You know, in Desire of Ages, when Christ, you know, before uh, it's in the chapter, let not your heart be troubled, page 678, it starts. Or, yeah, I think it's 678 in Desire of Ages. Um, but, you know, he knew that the life of his trusting disciples would be like his a series of uninterrupted victories, not seen to be such here, but recognized as such in the great hereafter. And of course, this is in the context of Christ seeking to do the work of salvation. He feels as if his work is a failure, because he's constantly um, uh, has a, what he sees, what is apparently failure. He's confronted with apparent failure. But yet he focuses upon God's promises instead of what he sees in his experience. So, so we know that this, this experience of Samson represents the experience of this movement. But ultimately, it's going to represent the experience of the 144,000, right, at the end of time in their victory. But we're, we're making an application to our movement at this time. So if we put uh, Judges 13.24 as, as the birth of Samson, Samson as the empowerment, um, we would just take Judges 13, uh, you know, verse 2. So 13.1 would be the darkness. It's just going to talk about the 40 years. And then we would have this message arise when an angel of the Lord appears unto Manoah's wife, right? And, and she's going to tell her husband. So that's going to be this formalization of the message 
that's going to be, uh, and then Manoah and his wife are going to in, entreat the Lord. So I would say that just the woman's message, um, when she tells her husband, so that's going to be um, verses one to seven, or two to seven. That sounds reasonable. Yeah. So we just put 13 verse two to seven. We'll say that that's the, um, yeah, we'll do it this way. I don't know if I need judges here. We'll just put 13, two to seven, 13, 24 is there. And so then you're going to have, um, So would you mean that 13.1 would be your period of darkness? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So 13.1, that's just going to talk about the darkness. Oops. 13.2 to 7 is that first message arriving. It's a prophetic message. Uh, it comes at the time of the end, right? Right. Okay. And then... Um, then we have this increase of knowledge. So that's going to be what the angel says to her, right? But then it's going to be formalized because she's now going to deliver this message to her husband. So maybe that's the formalization. I don't know. Uh, but, but her husband then is going to entreat the Lord. Could the uh, going to be versus offering be that as well? Yeah, so it's been in, right. So that's all the entreaty of the Lord. That's the whole interaction of Manoah and his wife with the angel once the message has been given to him. Okay. Okay. Understandable and, and very um, logical. Yeah. So, so in here, this formalization is going to be you know, basically 8 to 23, we can say. Right. So that's going to be uh, now. Th there's lots in this formalization, but we 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 can take this whole lot chapter thirteen and put it out on a line. But if we're just going to put it as the first message, uh, this would be one way of doing it. I'm not saying it's the best way of doing it, because we could break this up, and we could actually do this. So this is the other option. Is I can put the birth of Samson as the second message. And I can split this up that this conversation that first goes on um, is, is somehow broken up. Uh, I guess I don't want to do that. Just do this. Um, this. So then you're going to have uh, you could have all this stuff dealing with the offering as the empowerment now why would we do that why would i say that the empowerment is uh this whole aspect of the offering well the acceptance the okay. accept to me the acceptance would be that empowerment because this is god has accepted their offering from okay. what they understood from the the angel but if we if we look at this and keep it in the ironic sense the formalization would be better as being 8 to 14 and then your empowerment would be 15 to 23 right because in in a situation like this in the ironic sense you don't have an acceptance you have a rejection because the offering is being rejected okay i don't know if um uh i don't know that the ironic sense applies in that way that okay. we, we had decided the ironic sense only applied to the moral aspects of samson's character that's not, what i thought not okay. to any of the symbols but i don't see how the ironic sense because the, the offering is accepted here. Well, I mean, you're Manoah, saying it's rejected Ma initially? Manoah makes the offer wanting to detain Christ and prepare a meal, and Christ says no. 
I will not accept it as a meal. I will accept it as an offering. Okay. So that's the formalization. The first okay. part. Uh, so, um, yeah, I don't know if I understand what you mean. Um, all I look at is 8 to 14 is this a conversation about, uh, so the woman in, is going to first tell her husband, and then Manoah entreats the Lord. That's verse 8, right? Um, so... So that's just going to be addressing um, that conversation. And then in verse 15, he's going to detain him. Now there is, um, so in this, this is just this negotiation. That is, there's a revelation that occurs with this empowerment. So this formalization is this initial understanding of the message. So if we looked at Millerite history, can we see that this whole issue with this offering can be the empowerment of that message that's given to Manoah's wife in two to seven? Because there's this increase of knowledge that's occurring in that message being given to her. Um, now, now, we could even argue, well, the increase of knowledge could be relating to uh, Manoah himself. Uh, in treating the Lord. And, and that's probably partially true, but he now has this, there is this formalization of the message as the angel clarifies this message. So now the next step is this formalization. Now, so we haven't really addressed in this line, you know, the laying of the foundations, the work of the enemies or anything like that in this line, particularly. Um, so, you know, that's where somebody could have a criticism. Where's, where's the foundation being laid? Where's the work of the enemies? Um, you know, because you could just say, because we've had different ways we could look at this. We can say, well, the birth of Samson, that's the time of the end. All the other stuff is just precursor to that. So we could say chapter 13 is all about the period of darkness and the prophecy leading up to the time of the end and the birth of Samson is the time of the end. So, so you see, we have to figure this out um, in a logical way. So I'm saying this is one way we could do it, but there's other ways we could do it. And um, when, when it came to the lines that we drew before, right? Remember, this is chapter 15, right? So that's the third angel. That's the way that we would look at that. And we have these way marks also in chapter 14. And then in chapter 13, you know, we had July 18, 2020 as Judges 13, 13. So, so these lines are valid and we could make many valid lines. What we have to figure out is all of Judges 13, 14, and 15, all of Samson, how does it lay out on the line? So, so this, this is just another option, right? This is an option. Now, if this is the case, and we put the birth of Samson as the second angel arriving, we actually have a lot of information in chapter 14 and 15 that would relate to... Um, Uh, doubling. Well, yeah, because Samson's marriage. So that's that's what's going to be addressed here, and then in chapter fifteen, uh, you know, we're going to have um, this response. So this is really going to be part of chapter fourteen, right, with the three hundred foxes, and then. Um, Uh, actually, we got well. Actually, we got chapter sixteen. That's what. Then we have Samson and Delilah. So Samson, the way that we did this before, if I remember correctly, because we didn't even do chapter sixteen as far as a line. I don't think. 
think we had left that. I'm trying to remember. Yeah, so. Nope, we do have Judges 15 here. Yeah, see, so we had basically more charts dealing with Samson. Um, but we never did judge. Uh, we have this wave offering here. I'm trying to remember how we did this because I don't think I remember. So, so I'm going to do it this way because <clears throat> we actually, so all of this that we did, we're going to just get rid of it. And we're going to just say that uh, 1324 is the arrival of the first message. And all of this other stuff, we'll leave those there for now. Um, 1 to 23 is addressing the period of darkness and the prophecy uh, prior to the period of darkness. So, so it's another way it can be done. So, yeah, because we got chapter 16 as well. So then chapter 14, 15, and 16 are going to address um, the rest of this line. But, but you see that we could create multiple lines in the story of Samson. So I think the best way here to deal with Samson is having his birth as being the arrival of the first message. Because if we try to stretch that out, chapter 13, um, we actually have a lot more symbols in 14 and 15 and 16 that relate to uh, the, these way marks in our history. So, yeah, because we have this other diagram. Right? So this is going to be Judges 15 as well. So when we went through Samson, we went through it twice. <clears throat> now this is the third time. So, so if you're going to look at this increase of knowledge, there, the increase of knowledge would simply be um, Judges 13, verse 25. That is, the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshtaol. So there's this work that's being done with Samson. So a person could just say, uh, uh, this is going to be 13, 12. Or not 12, 25. Okay. So now we're going to have um, a formalization of the message. So what would be the formalization if we, if we keep going on in chapter 14? And Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman in Timnath of the daughter of the Philistines. And he came up and told his father and mother and said, I have seen a woman in Timnath of the daughter of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me to wife. Um, so, Angela, what are you saying? Sorry, I'm a bit behind because I was jumping from here to there. It takes me a long time to type things out. No, I was just uh, saying that it Judges 13, whatever references I put there, describe the time, the time of Jacob's trouble and how it parallels the struggle of the 144,000. And as they're wrestling with Christ, they don't realize it's, that he's sustaining them, right? And just like uh, <laughs> I know, at first he said, then... He knew that he was an angel of God after he saw it descend or him descend, ascend rather. Yeah. And you see, know, the thing I, is, yeah. So, so we take in the. Yeah. Go, go yeah. 
Judges 13, we took as a reform line itself. So, so when we tried to, and I think that that fits in with Judges 13 being a reform line, right? but we're going to take it as a waymark as, as being the birth of Samson. So now we have Samson's marriage, and Samson's marriage is, if we're going to put this on a line, we would say that the way marks that are shown here are going to be addressing uh, the first angel in our history. So the one thing that we still haven't done is marked when the birth of Samson is, but in our line, in our history, but we're going to do that. And we're going to do that based upon reading chapter 14. And Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman of Timnath of the daughter of the Philistines, right? He says, I saw this daughter of the Philistines in Timnath, this woman. I need her as a wife. And then his father and his mother said unto him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren or among all my people that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said unto his father, Get her for me, for she pleaseth me well. But his father and his mother knew not that it was the Lord that he sought an occasion against the Philistines. For at that time, the Philistines had dominion over Israel. So we know that behind this is a purpose that God has. Right? Right. So, so we know that the character of Samson is unchristlike. He's just succumbing to his human nature. But we, we can take this and look at this as, as a God's purpose. So if, if you're going to take this as Christ, um, Christ is going to come and save sinners, right? That is, he's going to make a church of who? The Gentiles, right? Right. So, so the Jews, in a sense, are rejected, and now he's going to go to the Gentiles. And so we could even apply this to, to Christ in this ironic sense. So if we were going to compare Samson, which we haven't done, which I think we need to, is uh, when we get to the line of Christ, I mean, we need to see how Samson uh, parallels Christ. But this is one way in which he parallels Christ. And we also have, you know, a whole bunch of aspects dealing with the chronology, the age of Samson, that Stephen has worked out. Um, all of these things, when we deal with Samson, uh, there's a lot of layers to Samson. But here we would have to look at that somehow that this is going to represent a formalization of a message. So Samson is, is born, the message arrives. But now we're going to have Samson's marriage. And, and we're going to say that this is going to re relate to a formalization of the message. If we're going to follow this model, right? So we may end up with a completely different way of looking at this line, but we're trying to take the entire line of Samson, so we got four chapters, 13 to 16. Um, and uh, we're going to say that this is all a line. Now, the way that we looked at it before, I believe, was uh, 13, 14, and 15 represented um, the first three messages, and 16 represented the fourth angel's message. But that, at least that's how I had it in my head, because uh, I remember now what we did. Um, and that is uh, this story of Samson and Delilah is a repeat of history, just as Millerite history is, you know, the, the three angels' messages. And then the fourth is our history, the Sunday law. And so that's what's represented in chapter 16. Somehow we didn't, I don't think we really drew sap, chapter 16 out on a line, though. 
least I can't find it. But um, so now we're going to have, uh, so we're not going to have like chapter 16 is the arrival of the third angel. We still haven't even placed dates on these in our history. We're just saying that there's a formalization of a message. We still haven't really fully defined what this period of darkness is and what these messages are, but we should be able to. Um, now we know that there's going to be, uh, that Samson's going to go down to Timnath, right? So we have this story. We went through this. And a young lion roared against him. And he's going to, um, it says, the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he rent him as he would have rent a kid. And he had nothing in his hand. But he told not his father and mother what he had done. And he went down and talked with the woman, and she pleased Samson well. And after a time, he returned to take her. And he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion, and behold, there was a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion. And he took thereof in his hands and went on eating and came to his father and mother, and he gave them, and they did eat. But he told not them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. So his father went down unto the woman, and Samson made there a feast. So he used the young, so for use, for so used the young men to do. Now, um, so the young lion roars against him. Now, we looked at a lot of stories. So we looked at the story of the disobedient prophet, right? Um, so that's going to be uh, some symbols there that are being addressed. We looked at the symbol of the honey, uh, eating the honey. Um, what other what other things were in here? Uh, Timnath itself, uh, the vineyards. What else? There's a riddle that's going to be talked about that needs to be unraveled. You also have the 30 companions. Yeah. So, so we're going to have tons, these tons of symbols uh, that we, that connect us to other stories. So this isn't a very simple line to just sort out. Um, now, when we had drawn this out originally, we had 9-11 and 11-9. Both of these represent the lion roaring. That's how we had done it before. So the lion doesn't roar twice, or does it? Now, uh, the significance of the lion roaring um, and this lion, how did, how did we connect that to the story of um, the disobedient prophet? What was, what was it about this lion? How did how do we apply the story of the disobedient prophet to our movement? How did Jeff do it? At the end, you know, because there was different applications at different times. I don't recall. Okay, so with the disobedient prophet, it's it's going to be addressing 977 BC, right? When the kingdom is divided. It's going to have in it the prophecy of Josiah. It's going to have that symbol of the midnight cry. So what does it represent in our movement, in, in the history of our movement? When does Jeff make this application to 977 and to the midnight cry and 
what was happening in our movement at the time. Because he's going to make this application. In, what time period? Yeah, well, he's, he's going to start doing this in 1919 or 1919, 2019 and 2020. So I think it's actually in 2020 that he's going to refer back to this. But it could have been, could have been wasn't that, 2019. Um, yeah. Wasn't what didn't he tie that with uh, the um, alpha and omega group? I mean the omega, whatever, whatever they right. refer to themselves. Yeah. To so he's gonna he's gonna attach this to um, September seventh, right? Twenty nineteen. Later on, right? So he's gonna say what happened on t September seventh is is it's going to be about nine seventy seven BC, the prophecy of Josiah, right? And the prophecy of Josiah is going to be about predicting July eighteen. Because that's how right. we're going to. That's going to be how we first come to July 18, 2020. You know, we have the symbol there before, but to place it July 18, 2020, as uh, the tenth day of the fifth month, that's going to come from studying Ezekiel, and that's going to come from understanding the prophecy of Josiah. Okay, and so. So Jeff makes an application there. So we can put that at 11-9-2019. But we also can place the lion roaring at 9-11, right? Why is that? I'm sorry. Again, I'm not recalling. I mean, <laughs> the pinball is swinging around in there, but the bumpers are sending it to different places. Okay. So we're going to go to Revelation chapter 10, right? So Angela got the right idea there. So when we go to Revelation chapter 10, um, we have this little scroll, right? This book, the little book. He has a little book open. Yeah. His right foot upon the sea, his left foot upon the earth, left foot upon the earth, and cried with a loud voice when, as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered and write them not. Um, so he's going to have his... Uh, uh, let's see here, his stand upon the sea and upon the earth, right? Lifted up his hand unto heaven, this angel, and he swears by him that liveth forever and ever, that there should be time no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants, the prophets. So now we know as Seventh-day Adventists, we apply this to... October 22nd, 1844, from 1798. So that is, I should say, from 1798 to October 22nd, 1844. Now, so we know in this period of time, this is the time of the end. But when we get to that, there should be time no longer. Now, initially, if you just read this, when the Millerites would read this, they would see that it's the end of the time prophecy of the 1260, right? So when you go to Daniel chapter 12 and you compare these two chapters, and we've done this many times, we can see the similarities. But there it's going to talk about how long shall be the vision, right? And it's going to talk about the time times and a half. And that's going to be the first half of the 2520. And then the second half of the 2520 is going to be expressed in the 1290 and the 1335, right? So instead of starting in 538 with the 1260, it's going to tar start from the point where the daily is taken away, 
that's going to be 508. And it's going to count 1290 days, which is 1290 years, and 1335 days, which is 1335 years. So it's going to really give us the period from February 15th, 1798 to um, April 18th, 1844, right? That's what it's going to give us, that period of time in Daniel chapter 12. In, Daniel, in Revelation 10, it's going to pick up this symbol from Daniel 12, and it's going to give us, bring us to the end of those prophecies. And, and if we were just reading verse 6, and, I, and, it's, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven, the things that therein are, and the earth, and the things that therein are, and the sea, and the things that which are therein, that there should be time no longer. We just, to Seventh-day Adventists, we say, oh, well, that's 1844. But actually, the prophecy is saying the time of the end is coming, that there should be time no longer. These things are coming to an end. So it doesn't say there is time no longer, that the time prophecies have all ended and you shouldn't prophesy time. That's not what it's literally saying. It's saying we're at the time of the end. And time is coming to an end, right? All of these time prophecies are going to be fulfilled. And then it says, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants, the prophets. So this is the se this seventh angel is which seventh angel? This question you should be able to answer. I'm sorry. What do, you, what do you mean? Which angel is which is the oh. seventh angel? Of what? What angels are these? It's the seventh angel of what angels? Because there's a seventh angel, but it's the seventh angel of what? Oh, um, which line? Okay, I, I, now I get what your question is. Yeah. So the seventh angel sounds October 22, 1844. On the 10th day of the seventh month, Revelation 10, 7. But it's the seventh angel of the seven trumpets, right? Okay, okay. So chapter 8 and 9 are the first six trumpets. Revelation 10, verse 7 is the seventh trumpet. Adventists don't quite get this, right? Now, people try to say in modern Adventism that the trumpets are future, right? Isn't that what they try to say? Well, yes, in a sense, yes. Okay, so yeah, that's what they say. The seven trumpets weren't fulfilled. Josiah Lich's prophecy was nonsense. They call it Satan's uh, counterfeit prophecy, right? They, they don't accept it, even though Ellen White plainly endorses it. But she also endorses Revelation chapter 10. So Revelation chapter 10 is going to address history that has happened. The little book was opened, right? The seven thunders uttered their voices. That's Millerite history. Right. This is Daniel right. chapter 12. Um, ties to Revelation 10. So there's just so much that that we need to go over because we should understand these things. Maybe maybe we all do, but we just need to be reminded of them. So when we start to look at the story of Samson, because we're, we're running out of time here today, so we're going to. We're going to construct these lines. We're going to do it properly, right? We're going to make sure that we look at everything and that we put these lines together in there in a, in a complete picture. Now, again, there's many different lines in the story of Samson, as you could see. That we, we could even take, you know, we did chapter 13, 14, 15 as separate lines. We didn't draw them out. We didn't draw the waymarks, but we can 
but we can create more than one, more than just those lines. There's other lines because just like the line of Christ, if you go into the time of Christ, there's multiple lines. And, and probably what we were doing when we started to just look at that line is we, we have a line for the arrival of the first angel. We have a line for the formalization of the message. We have a line for the empowerment of the first message. We have a line for the arrival of the second. We have a line for the formalization of the second. We have a line for the empowerment of the second. We have a line for the arrival of the third. Right? So, so there's these multiple lines. And if we're going to be able to present this to people, we have to understand what we're doing. And we have to be able to present it to them in its simplicity so that they don't just see us as being arbitrary. That we're just sort of making things up as we go. That's the line upon line. Right. So, so, we, yeah. so we have all of these multiple lines. We can create a line that addresses that period of darkness itself, right? There's actually a whole line there. So all of these, all of these lines that we have, um, you know, we have Millerite history that guides us. But we I don't think we've we've sorted this out yet. How to create these lines. Especially when they become really complex, like Samson. We're we're, th we're getting there. But we're not there yet. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so 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 we got our work cut out for us. There's not many time, not many months left to the camp meeting. I have to write out these notes, which I'm still trying to organize how I'm going to um, structure the notes. Because I have to think in the context of how many presentations I'm possibly going to do and how much I can present in a presentation. And, and I don't think I have time to write it out as complete papers, you know, with all of the uh the eyes crossed and the t's dotted right I, I don't think i'm gonna have the time to do that i'm gonna have the charts i'm gonna have some general notes some background information and uh and then what people can do is as we go through the presentations they'll have the notes and they, they're still gonna have to study this this is a lot of information so we're trying to in this in this study of samson particularly we're trying to take all of the information we've learned on understanding the lines, putting it into a package that we can present to others that they can understand and that they can then study. That's the whole plan from my perspective. So, so we have to be able to, to understand these symbols, the lion roaring. We need to know what that symbol is and where we can place it. And, and why we can place it there. Okay. So let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this morning. I pray for each person who participates in these studies and watches them, that, that you can help us together um, lay out these lines and that we can come to a clear understanding. We know, Lord, that Samson is a difficult study. We spent a lot of time on it, and yet we don't fully understand it. And so we ask for your help. Help us to be obedient to you this day and all the things that we do that we can represent your character and continue to watch over us. Have your angels take care of us. Provide healing uh, for us and men mentally uh, spiritually, physically. And uh, we ask for your blessing this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.